Uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the <clears throat> Homelessness and Poverty Committee of the Los Angeles City Council. My name is Marquise Harris Dawson, council member from the 8th District and chair of this committee. I'm joined by two members of the committee establishing a quorum, uh, Mr. Jose Wizar from Council District 14 and Mr. Mike Bonin from Council District 11. Uh, we have a number of items today, seven uh, in total. I will uh, begin the meeting as we always do by taking public comment um, from folks on those items. Uh, so um, we will begin. You know what? Let's do this. Can we read uh, all the items into the agenda now uh, so that we can take public comment on them? Item one is a motion, Bond and Wesson, relative to the evaluation of a city property located at 100 Sunset Avenue in Venice to determine if the property is suitable for development as a crisis and bridge housing facility and if the VA's West Los Angeles campus could be used for crisis and bridge housing. Item number two is a CAO report relative to Proposition HHH Permanent Supportive Housing Program proposed guidelines for fiscal year 2018-19 call for projects. Item number three is a city administrative officer report relative to fiscal year 2018-19 request for proposals for the proposition HHH facilities program fiscal year 2019 through 20 bond issuance. Item number four is a city administrative officer report relative to proposition HHH citizens oversight committee recommendations regarding changes to the permanent supportive housing process and funding structure. Item number five is a city administrative officer report relative to the emergency shelter needs assessment in the city. Item number six is a city administrative officer report relative to the emergency shelter needs in Skid Row. And item number seven is a city administrative officer report relative to Proposition HHH staff cost fee study. Thank you so much. So we'll begin uh, public comment. We've been joined uh, by our colleague and committee member, council member, Kern Price of the 9th District. I have uh, uh, for two minutes each, uh, two minutes each, called Carl Beyer, Paul Dumont, Eric Spillman. Come up in any order. Good afternoon, council members. Paul Dumont, I'm with the Silmar Neighborhood Council. Um, our Homelessness and Poverty Committee for the Neighborhood Council submitted a community impact statement supporting the request for this report. Um, we have obviously not had a chance to review the report. Um, my cursory view, review indicates that it does not list specific steps to implement housing for all of our neighbors experiencing homelessness by the end of this year. Um, I believe the motion stated by December 31st, 2018, was a request that I remember reviewing in, in our committee. Um, I don't see that in the motion now, but, but I would like to know. Um, I look forward to reviewing the report, and I appreciate your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any of the other names I call present? If not, we'll take you off the queue. Call Carl Beyer, Eric Spillman. Going once, twice. All right, Antonio Ramirez, Wayne Herman, and Rachel Maddow. Ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, fuck the ACLU, fuck the state bar, fuck the state bar who is supposed to oversee their attorney's misconduct, but these Masonic assholes don't do shit. What they do, what they have done is contributed to homelessness, poverty, and gang stalking. Like the fucking FBI, NSA, CIA, and Department of Homeland Security. Again, these assholes need to be executed. Tortured, murdered, executed. Because what we have gone through is torture on a daily basis. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, homelessness is also been contributed by unethical attorneys. I have talked to countless homeless people, and they have also said that they've been victims of bad lawyers. And um, 
I'm very sorry for that. Second of all, ladies and gentlemen, what is not being addressed by the homeless committees is crimes. We are subjected to crimes on a daily basis. We are being robbed, fear intimidation, harassed, stalked, and, um, and pushed around, bullied, and cut in line. I can't stand people who cut in front of me. Boy, I go through the roof when they try to cut in front of me. God dang. And having said that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to address crime problems because Central ain't doing it. Okay? Let's take those gangbangers and wet facts and, and, and gangbangers and you fuck, stick a fucking napalm up their asses. Get ice, ice, ice and shove it. Shove them out of here. Please, we've got to address the problems of the gangs and, the, and, and all the others. What they're doing is all the goddamn gangbangers, wetbacks, and criminal pedophiles, they walk around all night long robbing the innocent people, and then they sleep at night at City Lawn, uh, right here at the City Hall Lawn, then the Pueblo Park, and, um, and now at Grand Park, and that's where they lay low all day long. So what I want you to do is ID the motherfuckers and... Uh, detain them, arrest them, and deport the fucking wetbacks and gangbangers. Stop the crimes. Stop the crimes. That's your Thank time. You. All right. Uh, start the clock. I can see already. The Uncle Tom already started my fucking time before I'm up here. It's good. Django Unchained is 2.0. So we got number one, Mike Bonin, putting a greasy dick up the area of Venice. Sticking it up the asses, everybody living near and about 100 Sunset Avenue with the big greasy dick of the city. Going to be turning shit into the VA West Los Angeles Slumlord Council Committee. Yeah. They're going to peep trailers all over the place with all those rich Jew motherfuckers around that property because you know they all got money. And now they're going to be back in the hood. The hood is moving west. The hood is moving closer and closer to all you rich white motherfuckers because you paid to put these motherfuckers in office, and now they're going to stick a big, greasy city dick up your ass and ruin your community like my community, like Harris Dawson's community, like Current Price's community. They turn it into shit. They move over here and they run for office so they can turn your community into a bigger piece of shit than the one they came from. Yes, that's right. They are berating you. Yes, you're being berated. Berated under the guise of homeless. You're not going to help no homeless. You're just going to take parking lots away from people so you can take that big greasy dick and shove it up the ass of all those wealthy people. That's right. Welcome. You're going to see people look just like me with three fucking teeth under your bed at night, and when you call 911, you're going to be time. on hold like a dumb nigga, like this one here. Yeah, and I he, got my seconds back. <laughs> please start the clock on the two minutes. One more disruption, and we'll ask you to leave, Mr. Mr. Spindler. Berated. How are we berated in these issues? Well, HHH has not resolved any problem. Supportive housing proposals for proposition, and supportive housing process and funding structure, none whatsoever. Donald Trump figured it out. Put the wetbacks in chains and stick them behind fences, and that's affordable housing. That's where you stick those little fucking wetbacks who come into my country, your country here, all of you here who are Americans, and they rape the motherfuckers of this city out of resources, services, and programs. Berated. I've been berated by a white nigga who says that city administrative officers report relative to an emergency that we need shelters. No motherfucker nigger. I need a bed. A motherfucking bed. What is my general public comment today, folks? I'll tell you. There was a particular gentleman who used the definition of a word called Berate, berate, berate. And he, he used the word allegations against a particular individual, Armando Herman for the record, 
injuring a child by using offensive, vague, and ambiguous scolding and criticism angrily. I'm not fucking angry. I'm just very fucking upset that I got a white nigger up there named Dawson who rebuked, scold, and reproach me the same way that fat, bald, fuck Weezar did at Plum. And look, the dumb white nigger Herman, the Jew, is standing before you because I am a god and I will go back to Plum after I fuck you with the greasy water hose. Thank you, Mr. Herman. For the record, uh, my accusation against you was that you verbally assaulted a child in my presence within the last 24 hours. Um, item number one, can we get the public comment speakers for item number one up on the queue? All right, uh, we have Mr. Frank Romero, uh, Jeremy Burdick, Carmel Beaumont. This will be uh, short. Uh, hello, Chairman and the members of the committee. My name is Frank Romero Crockett. I am the public affairs officer at the United Way of Greater Los Angeles and one of the point people in the Everyone In campaign. We're just here to say we're in support of the location at 100 Sunset Avenue in Venice for crisis and bridge housing. And we will leverage the growing Everyone In network of residents to support this project and create the consensus that we need to move it forward. And we just want to acknowledge the, uh, the leadership of uh, Mike Bonin and thank him for his support. Thank you. Thank you. messaging for this project. Mr. Herman, you're excused from this meeting. Please leave immediately. You follow the sergeant. All you can do is believe bullshit lies and make false allegations. That's why I have a right to tell you your face. Because you're fucking lying. Please leave the meeting. Thank you. Chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Wizar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. City Attorney, can we get a report in this committee at our next committee as to what is the proper decorum for public speakers? This individual at every committee meeting, every council meeting goes through the same procedure, same process. We end up expelling him from every meeting, and I don't see how we could continuously uh, have to be disrupted by the same individual every single day, every single council meeting, every single committee meeting. I would ask the city attorney's office to advise us what we can do to have this individual not disrupt us any longer. It is not something that's good for the public or the conduct of this meeting. And everything he is speaking about has nothing to do with the purpose and topic of this committee. Can we get a report on that at the next committee meeting? Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, one of the biggest selling points of the local community has been encampment cleanup funds. Uh, however, there's only 100 beds in the shelter, and there's like close to 1,000 homeless people in Venice. So, you know, some of the messaging has referenced former encampments, but obviously, you know, with 900 people left, there's not going to be former encampments. They're still going to exist. So, I mean, how can we clean up encampments if they still exist? Um, so one of those promises can't really be fulfilled. Secondly, you know, this is supposed to be a three-year temporary shelter. However, after three years, it's unlikely that all these people will have permanent housing. So is there going to be a continuance of the state of emergency indefinitely? Like, what assurances do we have that this will actually end in three years? Is there a legal obligation to shut it down in three years? Like, where, where how does this work? That's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Carmel Beaumont. Oh, there you are. Got John Dosh, Travis Binan, Binan. Ready? Yes, ma'am. All right. I am a 43-year resident owner living about 150 feet south of the bus yard, 
And I'm not able to oppose or support this location based on the limited information provided on the Abridge Home webpage and FAP, nor the subsequent open house held on June 13th. I also want to be very clear to this committee that um, Councilman Bonin's approach to disseminating information via this webpage is very skewed toward getting opinions only from those who support bridge housing at the bus yard location and discourages anyone who has not made up their mind and are merely trying to get information about the project in order to make an informed decision. As an example, the announcement about the bridge uh, program received, you, to sh you could only show your support. You couldn't, you, you couldn't do anything other than that. It, it just discourages people from trying to get information and it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. Thank you. Deborah Groning. All right, that concludes our public comment on this. Oh, Travis. My name is Travis Finnan. I've been uh, at 700 Main, right across from the bus depot for about uh, seven years. I'm opposed to the project. A little closer to the mic, Travis. Yeah, I'm opposed to the project, and so I'm opposed to the feasibility study. Uh, I think we have, I've read we have thousands of beds that are vacant, and I think those beds should be filled first. Uh, I think we should look at the feasibility problem, or the feasibility uh, study should be around how we fill the beds that we currently have. Uh, I also think that putting a shelter two blocks from the beach is going to only exasperate the problem. I think the problem could get a lot worse. I think. If there's only 100 beds that are proposed, I don't see how that's going to clean up the encampments when there are 1,000 homeless people in Venice. And I think that area is already super congested. So if you have 100 beds, and I've heard there's going to be storage and 24 hour, 24 by 7 people coming and going, you're still going to have to have uh, everybody to clean the place. You're going to have to have food services. You're going to have to have health care services. And I just, uh, that area is congested. So thank you. Mr. Bonin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to the uh, folks. Um, pardon me. Tell me, what's your name? Uh, John Dosh. Ah, OK. Yeah, thank you. When, we, when I call you, you should come, come on up, line oh. up, so we're ready. I'm thank sorry. you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you got it. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I wanted to uh, um, address the uh, city council. Uh, I live across the street at uh, Dogtown Station. I live across the street from the MTA property um, and I represent I'm on the board so I represent about 50 people that live in that property 100% uh, of which are opposed to this project um, I think that the manner in which the project has been publicized has been misleading to say the least um, I think at the last event we had at the elementary school uh, less than a block away from the property last Wednesday was advertised as a town hall, but it was anything but. It was more of a science project. If anyone was there, I know Mr. Bonin was there. I think Mr. Bonin spoke to four people while I was watching of the 100 or so that were there. There was no, there was no opportunity to present um, our opinions, and it was presented as a foregone conclusion that this project was going to happen. So I, I, I'm opposed to the project, and I think that the local residents need to be more informed and brought to bear, and their opinions need to be brought to bear in the decision. Thank you. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sit down, Mrs. Spindler. I just want to say I oppose that Buckham project, yes. Please see Mr. Spindler out, Sergeant at Arms. Thank you. Well, see the puppet out along with Mr. Spindler. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, we'll wait till he gets out. We have to uh, use up staff time and time of the public waiting for Mr. Spindler, Spindler to be seen out of the building because he continues to disrupt as he slowly walks out. Mr. Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to the uh, folks and the neighbors from Venice uh, who came down today. My apologies that you were subjected to uh, the uh, profanity and the racial epithets and the shenanigans. Uh, it's a regular feature at the City Hall reality show, thanks to some court rulings. 
um, again, apologies on that. Um, so uh, thank you, colleagues. Before us today is uh, a motion which would uh, initiate with Bureau of Engineering the feasibility analysis of two different properties for bridge housing uh, in my district, uh, one at the metro, former Metro bus yard uh, on Sunset and, and Maine and Pacific in Venice, uh, and the other uh, on the VA property in Brentwood. Um, this, uh, for those in the audience, this doesn't uh, give approval to anything. This, this uh, all it does is initiate uh, the feasibility analysis by our Bureau of Engineering, which will give us the opportunity to then have more concrete information on what uh, can be proposed so that the community can uh, weigh in more specifically and more precisely uh, once BOE comes back with some details about how things could be laid out, uh, what the capacity could be, and, and a number of other things. Uh, so um, I am uh, glad to join Mr. O'Farrell and Mr. Kuretz and Mr. Wesson and Mr. Krikorian and others who have already suggested properties in, in their districts for feasibility analysis. Uh, and I know there's a number of others on the council who are about to do the same. So um, uh, I think it's uh, wise for the city to move forward on this. And uh, just a, a quick note uh, for those um, who were curious about the uh, length of the bridge home program. The mayor's articulated a, a three-year horizon. And the uh, property in, in Venice would only be available for Metro for about three years. They're actually going to begin uh, a community engagement process for their uh, joint use development, which will go there. Uh, and they're going to need the property back in, in a couple of years. So it puts a horizon there. So uh, thank you very much. And I ask uh, for an I vote. Thank you. Um, there's no further discussion. That'll be the order. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a number four, uh, which I'd ask that we take on consent. Uh, so that'll be the order there. And then I would ask um, H. Sid uh, to uh, come forward to um, give testimony on item number two. I'm Tim Elliott, uh, development manager at HSID. Um, when the Triple H program got um, approved last year, we were uh, directed to report back on uh, what the regulations could, how the regulations could be changed to ensure that more qualified developers were eligible to apply and to uh, ways to expedite the delivery of homeless housing in um, including uh, campus style projects. So based on that, we've uh, um, had a, st a stakeholder process. We had a, a meeting at our offices. We had uh, 51 people from 37 different organizations. And then we had, um, we conducted an online forum and, and got 14 responses from developers, neighborhood councils, consultants, public agencies, and trade organizations. So based on the feedback that we got, we're proposing the following changes uh, for the next fiscal year. Um, See, so under the current regulations, the uh, developers have had to have built uh, and operated two special needs housing developments for at least a year. Um, and with the, but since the, since the regulations were approved, Measure H, the county's Measure H has gotten uh, passed, and then money is available for service provision uh, on a much broader scale. So <clears throat> we think that there might be an opportunity for market rate developers to partner with these county funded service providers, um, and, and may, which may be more cost efficient. So uh, the, the proposed regulations would say that uh, developers would just have to have built two projects uh, of any kind uh, open for the last year, but that the uh, service provider partner uh, have um, uh, voting uh, authority over uh, program operations. Uh, so there was some concern that, uh, you know, that that could have uh, negative consequences, but um, we think that this is, strikes a good balance between uh, the for-profit and non-profit sectors. Um, 
So the, uh, the current regulations say that the minimum number of units, supportive housing units in any project is 20. And we've talked to uh, developers of large multi-phase projects, and they feel that they can adequately provide uh, services um, over the whole over a, a whole uh, campus, like a like a housing development or uh, housing authority project. So what we thought was that so projects over 200 units, uh, that the minimum number of supportive housing units would be based on a percentage. So it's 10 percent for projects larger than 200, uh, and then we would have to have a phasing schedule and, um, and and a plan to make sure that they could deliver the services adequately. Um, one of the things that we got the most comment about is the interest rate that we charge. Um, developers are telling us that uh, that because of tax reform, there's a shorter depreciation period, and uh, that essentially is is uh, diluting the value of the tax credits because um, they're just worth less to uh, uh, to, to investors. Uh, so what we thought we could do is offset some of those. Um, those losses by lowering our interest rate by up to two percentage points if it can be demonstrated that uh, that, that would uh, make the project feasible. Um, so a number of commenters had suggested that the $12 million uh, per project cap be eliminated or uh, increased. Uh, and we've seen some developers uh, try to get around that cap by splitting their projects into two. Now that's allowed under the tax code, but we uh, felt the need to, to set some, some boundaries, and so we're suggesting that you can't split a project in two until it's, unless it's at least 150 units. Um, and then we're also seeing projects approaching, uh, the HHH loan ap approaching 50% of the total development cost, and um, we're recommending that we establish that as a, as a, as a maximum. Um, and uh, so the, the guidelines also make clear They've all, always said that we were open to innovative projects, but we want to make clear here that that, um, that non-tax credit projects are eligible for the same amount of subsidy as the as the, the lower amount of subsidy that we offer 9% tax credit projects, and that, that they don't necessarily have to have a project-based operating subsidy. As long as they can uh, prove uh, financial feasibility, they could have, uh, the tenants could have their own um, their, their own vouchers or, or other form of operating subsidies, uh, if, if that made it uh, possible. Um, so when the uh, HHH loan uh, regulations were uh, adopted, it was anticipated that the, the county's no place like home funds would be available by the middle of this year. Well, that program has been challenged in court, and that, that um, actually may be on the uh, November ballot. So we're recommending that um, we, we had a $80,000 per unit boost for supportive housing projects uh, until that money became available. And we're recommending that that, that boost be continued uh, until the money is available. And then uh, even after that, that the boost uh, be available to projects in uh, what, we, what we call high, high resource census tracts, uh, which is in alignment with the city's fair housing plan. and. Um, or for projects that, that, that dedicate more than 80% of their um, uh, units for supportive housing, that that boost would continue past the $12 million uh, mark up to a maximum of uh, $16 million, but subject to that overall 50% of total development cost uh, uh, provision. So, um, you know, we, we think that these will be, you know, helpful to the community. And um, so we've, we've been uh, directed to, in, we're going to have three rounds of funding under these regulations. In the third round, um, if, if, we're, if possible, we want to have an innovation round based on a different set of guidelines that we're going to be preparing between now and then. So we, we want to, as soon as these are approved, we want to issue the next call for projects in July. And then we'll have another one. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, any questions on this item? I don't see any. Uh, one question uh, with respect to your testimony uh, this afternoon. You uh, described uh, changing some of the requirements so that developers that hadn't worked on special needs projects could participate. 
and you indicated that there was some concern about that even after knowing that uh, we could stipulate that the service providers be people uh, with verifiable experience, um, which I would note we don't necessarily even have that requirement in other social services like GRID. Um, but uh, you mentioned that there were still concerns. What, what were those concerns? Well, the, the, the concerns were that um, you know, lowering the bar would bring in people that didn't have that kind of experience. But what, in, in terms, lowering the bar in terms of? H having done special needs housing directly before. I mean, the, the, the nonprofit community felt very strong, uh, strongly in that regard. But, but it was recommended that, in, that uh, and, and this was compromise language, that if the, if the, the service provider partner had control over the operations, that would lessen the, the, the concerns that they had. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we uh, will approve this item if there's no objection. Hearing none, that'll be the order. Um, now if we could uh, hear items uh, number three. And perhaps you can give testimony on number seven as well. The fee study, no you cannot. They both, they both say CAO, so. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Meg Barclay with the uh, City Homeless Coordinator in the CAO's office. Item three is a report relative to recommendations from the Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee um, regarding the uh, fiscal year's 2018-19 request for proposals for the facilities program. At, our, at this time, it is our recommendation that um, you approve a suspension of the RFP for the facilities program for Prop HHH for one year, pending, um, well, just to give some time to uh, see where, as, as Tim was mentioning, where another, other sources of financing for the, the permanent supportive housing loan program come in over the course of the next year to see if um, we are gonna continue to need that additional supplemental subsidy for uh, permanent supportive housing units. We wanted to give some time to dedicate the program to PSH since that really is the focus of the program. We, um, we did some a little analysis. The report discusses that at the current rate of subsidy, we won't be able to re meet the anticipated 10,000 unit goal for Proposition HHH. And we've, we've uh, been doing a lot of work over the last year to including establishing a working group of staff from multiple city departments to um, establish sorry, to establish a process for um, establishing interim housing more quickly using prefabricated structures, which are not Proposition HHH eligible, but do meet the more immediate demand for an alternative to street homelessness in the, in the period of time that it will take to get Proposition HHH funded permanent and supportive housing units online. And so we're recommending a one-year pause to the facilities program in order to see how the broader financing picture is going to suss out over the next year as it relates to permanent supportive housing finance, um, and then we can revisit that um, as we get closer to the end of this fiscal year, and we'd make recommendations whether or not to reestablish the RFP at that time. Questions? All right, hearing none, we'll, we will um, approve item number three. Um, can you talk to us about item number seven? Yes, sir. Uh, item seven is also re recommendations from the Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee relative to a proposed fee study to establish uh, the basis for a fee uh, to charge for staff costs that are not eligible for Proposition HHH reimbursement. Um, as we've reported previously, staff costs on non-city sponsored projects that are not technical in nature, so that's um, City-sponsored projects like our Bureau of Engineering actually does project management, work that's directly related to the construction of the project. But underwriting, contract administration, those types of costs are not eligible for Proposition HHH administration. And this year, for example, the general fund was, um, was, was funding additional positions at HSID to cover those needs. So we would like to request, or the, the report recommends that we um, 
engage a consultant through three pre-qualified lists, two at the city administrative officer's office and one at the economic and workforce development department to um, engage a consultant to perform a study that would be the basis for a fee that could recover staff costs associated with Proposition HHH implementation that are not reimbursable under Proposition HHH. The source of funds for the um, study is interest that's accrued on bond proceeds that were issued last year. The city attorney has confirmed that this is an eligible cost and the uh, administrative oversight committee recommends using up to $200,000 for this study. If we need additional funding, we'll come back and request it. But once this is approved, we would, we would be going out to those lists to get an estimate for the amount of, of, a, um, of a study to establish a fee for the five different city departments that are implementing Proposition HHH. Thank you. Uh, questions, members? Um, the, this uh, expenditure that you're recommending uh, substantiates what portion of the earned interest? It's about a third of the earned interest. Third? Yeah. Okay, so we would have two thirds left. And uh, you did indicate that you come back to us should uh, more be necessary or desired. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Chairman, Price. One, one quick question, May. Again, thanks for your, for your effort. Um, on the uh, issue of outreach to uh, including houses of worship mm -hmm. in the outreach efforts, what are, we, what are we doing in that respect exactly? I mean, is, is there really an organized? I know we've. Uh, As it relates I've to. Had, yeah, we've had some in District 9, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. The chairs had some meetings in 8, but is there a way we can sort of, you know, combine, bring together, or. or As it relates to Proposition HHH implementation? Yeah. So we did really extensive outreach when we were doing the RFP to establish the projects for the existing, for the 1819 project expenditure plan for the facilities program. And as I understand, oh, H said just um, reported on options to in kind of expand the eligible applicants for the permanent supportive housing loan program. And I'm not sure the extent to which that would make it easier for house, for faith-based organizations to participate as a part of those deals, but um, those are those are the, the things we've been doing to try and expand. There's no eligibility restriction mm -hmm. as it relates to, it's more around experience and- It'll be um, case by case then as they come Yeah, in. exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. There's no other questions or comments. Uh, move that we approve this item. Thank you. And concur with the AOC on that matter. Um, that takes us to um, item number five and six, if we could uh, consider those together. I believe, um, well, let's take public comment first. Uh, if you could show me number five, which there are no speakers for, and then number six, Shelby Lee. Tell me your name. I couldn't hear that, but Ryan, we'll Kelly. Ryan Kelly. Okay, Ryan Kelly, you're after Ms. Shelby. Okay. Hey, my name is Shelby Lee. Um, I'm a member of the Democratic Socialist of America, and I believe that housing is a human right. Um, I absolutely um, support more shelters uh, um, citywide. I think it's among the things we should be doing. Um, but I absolutely do not support uh, Garcetti's proposed $29 million um, toward more police and more sanitation. Um, that would go along with those shelters. Um, $29 million is a staggering amount that makes it clear that the city is bent on criminalizing poverty. Um, homelessness is not a crime. It is a side effect of a system that is um, built to protect the property of a few at the expense of everyone else. Um, and I urge you to use that $29 million in more constructive ways, or constructive ways at all. Um, we don't need more police and we don't need more sanitation sweeps. They're not solving the problem. Um, we need better, better and more services for unhoused folks, and we need permanent housing. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yes, my name is, my name is Ryan Kelly. I'm also with the Democratic Socialists of America. My comments are primarily for Mr. Harris Dawson. I was singularly disappointed by your recent comments to the effect that the LAPD arrests very few homeless people. Practically none, you said. 
I wish you would speak with the people we speak with, the people on the streets brutalized by the sweeps who tell us not only of arrests, but of threats, intimidation, and violence. Talk to those people and not Commander Choi or whatever professional liar the LAPD keeps on retainer to mollify council members. Regarding the almost $30 million now earmarked for LAPD and sanitation sweeps, if you took all of that money and lumped it into a pile in the street and set it ablaze, you would be doing more to address homelessness in Los Angeles than what you have it earmarked for. At least then you'd be keep, keeping people warm and giving them a light to read by. You could use it for paper mache, literally anything. You're spending money to make the problem markedly worse and contributing only to the cause of human misery. Please do something else with it. Thank you. So we're uh, considering uh, shelters broadly and then shelters in Skid Row, and I believe uh, Mr. Wizar is going to have some um, input uh, on one of these matters as we go forward. Just a heads up to everybody. Yes, so the motions requested reports on the availability of shelter, housing placement, um, improvements made by LASA to the shelter system to improve outcomes and to engage uh, additional nonprofits or faith-based organizations and recommended recommendations to expand shelter capacity. Uh, the motion, Bonin, Harris, Dawson, Buscayano under item five, it requests this information citywide. Um, and motion, Wezar, Harris, Dawson, Blumenfeld, requests this uh, similar information for Skid Row in CD14. So LASA has submitted a report as well in response to motion, the motion on item five, and they'll present those findings. They're also attached to the CAO report. And um, Susie Rios Belknot from our from our office will present the CAO's uh, additional information provided in those reports. Go ahead, Paul, Dun Paul Duncan, with uh, Associate Director of Performance Management at LASA. Um, so, in this report, we laid out currently what the bed capacity is within the city of Los Angeles, what the um, what's planned upcoming. So. And then address the what would what it would need, what would be needed in order to address um, working towards sheltering all people experiencing literal homelessness. Um, we do not have the 20, 2018 homeless inventory count, so this report is using the twenty seventeen homeless inventory count to look at um, shelters within Los Angeles City. That includes both LASA funded shelters as well as other governmental funded shelters as well as privately funded shelters and transitional housing programs. In 2017, um, in January of that year, we had 10,202 um, beds between our interim housing and our transitional housing programs. Um, in 17-18, the number of beds that LASA was funding at that, um, at that during the year was 3,154 beds, and that's including um, 1,753 interim housing beds within Los Angeles, 770 transitional housing beds, and 631 winter shelter um, beds in that time. Currently, uh, LASA has brought on some additional beds um, in this past year. So there were 102 interim beds that were brought on, and then there were 239 additional transitional housing beds, or transitional housing beds specifically for transitional age youth that were brought in, brought online in fiscal year 17, 18. Um, on top of that, we increased our capacity to shelter uh, families experiencing homelessness in the city and county of Los Angeles. Uh, additional funding was put into that, but due to capacity of finding shelters, much of that money goes to motel vouchers and it fluctuates on a nightly basis. Um, so in the end, we looked at some different methodologies on addressing the, the issue of sheltering all persons experiencing homelessness. And speaking to outreach experts, we 
got some feedback on what do we feel the number of people that would be willing to come into shelter versus those that no matter what we did we are going to refuse to come in. Um, based upon that feedback, we said that 85% of the people experiencing literal homelessness would be willing to go into a shelter program if it was available. Um, and based upon that, we, we did a couple things. We looked at what is the appropriate size shelter that um, seems to have the most effect. And this is also based on a bridge to home, um, the same approach trying to keep sites that are 100 beds or less, um, as we have found that those programs tend to be more effective than our larger shelters that have over 200, our largest shelter program has over 400 beds. Um, and then we looked at uh, two different approaches, one looking at um, sheltering everybody, another that broke out those that are dwelling in vehicles and RVs as those people are, tend to be less uh, likely to access shelter. We had also an approach of a ramp up and then we had one, we have a number without a ramp up. So if we tried to shelter all persons experiencing homelessness within Los Angeles, um, regardless of whether they're living on the street or within a vehicle. Um, Lhasa's estimate is that the first year we would need $657 million in order to, um, without a ramp up, if everything started on day one, um, in order to build those sites, get staffing in them, and provide services. With a ramp up that looks at a start and a ramp over up over a year period, there would be some operation savings. That estimation would be somewhere around 500 million. Um, so in addition to that, um, we also took a exercise that's a lot of estimates as there's a lot of factors that go into um, looking at the the overall scope of how can we begin to house people and make sure that these beds aren't something that are needed, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. Um, so we took into account uh, what's being done with Measure H and working to get people into housing. And then we also made some additional recommendations that in order to ramp this down, because shelters are an expensive intervention, um, is to, we also made some recommendations around permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing that could be funded in order to reduce that and make sure that we are starting to ramp down these beds over time and not have long-term um, interim housing programs. So on top of our recommendation for this, we also identified that providing $264 million towards additional permanent support, supportive housing, um, rental assistance and services, as well as 66 million towards rapid rehousing on an annual basis would allow us to, to get down um, over a 10 year period to where instead of 20,000 shelter beds um, to shelter all persons experiencing homelessness, we'd only need 5,000. Hi, my name is Susie Rios Belenot. I work in the CAO's office. Uh, both motions requested information on the consideration of public facilities as locations for temporary shelters, so I will present those items together. The asset management group in the CAO's office is reviewing Department of Transportation parking lots for interim and permanent housing, in addition to a list of approximately 500 properties that are being considered as surplus properties by GSD. For the purposes of these two reports, we filtered the DOT parking lot lists for those that may be able to support either temporary structures for interim housing or to support safe parking programs. Temporary structures, we um, 
Temporary structures require at least 20,000 square feet to accommodate approximately 70 beds and the requisite amenities, such as hygiene facilities, storage, uh, case management. Our office found 32 surface lots meeting that criteria citywide, which could accommodate an estimated 3,080 beds. And we found no sites specific to the Skid Row area, but three within a three mile radius with an estimated bed count of 210. Safe parking programs, on the other hand, require a minimum of 30 parking spaces to accommodate at least 14 vehicles and the requisite hygiene stations. Our office found 86 parking lots with 30 more of these spaces citywide, which could serve an estimated 5,316 vehicles. And no suitable uh, DOT lots were found in the Skid Row area or immediate vicinity. This office also reviewed a list of potential emergency or disaster shelter locations provided by Recreation and Parks and the Emergency Management Department, all located at Rec and Parks operated senior centers or recreation centers. These locations are not feasible for use as interim housing at this time. Uh, the reports also summarize the city's recent efforts to establish new interim housing facilities, which include the Temporary Structures Working Group uh, that has staff from multiple city departments as well as LASA to collaborate to more quickly establish temporary facilities throughout the city. Additionally, uh, the most recent budget just adopted by the council and the mayor last month um, included $20 million for the Crisis and Bridge Housing Fund to establish more interim facilities throughout the city, an additional $10 million to support that program and related homeless services, and of course, as other items have covered today, the Prop HHH Facilities Program, which will fund seven projects or 196 beds beginning construction in 1819. We remain available for any questions you may have. Questions, comments, Ms. Price? Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll focus, uh, obviously, on item five, uh, since I know Mr. Wiesar will be getting deep into item six. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for the, for the work on this. I know it was a big ask, and uh, the report back was uh, very thorough and very comprehensive, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, characteristically, I, I want more, uh, and there's stuff I'm going to ask for. Uh, but first, let me just say what my takeaway is on this. Um, they're no fault of yours. All you did re reporting the facts, so I'm not shooting the messenger here, but what this says is there are going to be tens of thousands of people sleeping on our streets and on our sidewalks for a long time to come. I mean, that's what this says. Uh, unless we uh, come up with the resources and the will to uh, spend an additional half billion dollars uh, a year and hire 1,400, 1,500 new people. That's essentially what this says. Uh, and that's sad and sobering, um, but it probably, unfortunately, is realistic, um, given how long it's going to take us to get the bridge housing on board, you know, 15, 16 different projects, just hopefully by the end of the year. And I, I understand where this is come from, coming from. I, I find it in, in, incredibly frustrating. Um, and I have a couple specific questions about additional information that I'd like to to see. One thing, I, I, I apologize if I wasn't clear about this in my ask, but when this was in committee, in addition to the ask about the um, sort of the emergency framework, which CAO came back with, thank you, about um, uh, how much it would cost to, to do things like FEMA and, and, and stuff like that, uh, I thought I had asked, and if I didn't, I apologize. I'd like to see how our per bed cost compares with other cities, uh, New York and, and, and San Francisco. You know, I, I'm, I'm scandalized by how expensive it is to do a, a unit of permanent supportive housing here. I want to know how our per bed costs compare. Uh, Paul uh, noted uh, correctly that shelter is a very expensive uh, intervention. Sidewalks are a very expensive non-intervention. So um, uh, I'd like to, to see that comparison so I can figure out if there's a way we can bring down our costs. Um, the other thing that uh, is, is sort of missing for this, and, I, and I've asked for this in a couple different forums, is a lot of the numbers in here 
uh, don't have a lot of meaning unless I sit with a, a calculator and, and, and do some math. And, and what I want to be able to see for me, for my colleagues, for the public is what, what this means in terms of capacity. When we say that, um, you know, there are uh, 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 10,000 total beds, that's X percentage of the need. Uh, when we say that there are 2,948 family beds, that's X percentage of the need for family beds. There's no way to quantify how well we're doing unless we know how much of the need this responds to. And then what I want, and I, and I, and I want that for everything in here, is, is the percentage of, of the need that is currently being addressed. Uh, and then I want us to be able, at the beginning of this fiscal year, to say, with the resources that this council has provided, with the resources the state has provided, with the resources the county has provided, what percentage of the need are we attempting to address this year? What percentage of the unsheltered population in Los Angeles are we hoping with these resources to shelter? And then, at, at the quarter and at the half and at the third quarter and at the end of the year, I want us to measure how well we did, both against the need and our attempts to address a portion of that need. Because uh, otherwise, th this, th this is uh, uh, information, but without the, the appropriate context to judge how well we're doing. Uh, you know, we can celebrate that we added more beds this year, but you know, it's still a drop in the bucket. Uh, and I think we need to, to, to know that. Um, the, um, the other thing is, since you're, you're doing that, uh, coming back with the percentages, would it be possible to use the new numbers that we now have? I will talk to our data and research team around the timeline of the release of the homeless inventory count, which looks at the beds um, on January of this year, and see if that is feasible. Okay. I, I don't want you to start the report over from scratch, but if that is available, it's just more current context. Um, and uh, the, you, you said that you determined your percentage of how many people would uh, uh, accept shelter based on conversations with the service providers. Uh, I'm curious how much of a, a conversation there has been with people who are, are living on the streets uh, or who recently lived on the streets about the, the, the barriers to shelter. Yeah, I've, I've talked with a lot of folks since we proposed the bridge housing in, in, in my district about what works and, and what doesn't. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious if, if we know or we have the opportunity in our, uh, not in our visual point in time count, but in our demographic counts to ask people about what the barriers are for them. Um, again, I'll talk to our data and research team around the, the demographic survey um, in the future homeless count. I will say in A Bridge to Home, we have been taking into account feedback around what people have voiced as barriers to going into, into our programs, and we are trying to address many of those things, making sure that people's pets can stay with them by their bed. There's an area for their pets to to relieve themselves. Um, we've also been looking at things such as um, spaces for couples within our shelters. Most people will not leave um, their partner if they feel like they have to be separated. Um, so we have been looking at what are some ways that we can be more creative, more flexible, and reduce some of the barriers that people have identified historically. So when the service providers said they would anticipate that 85% of the people would say yes, were they saying yes to the bridge housing model or were they saying yes to one of the other models? I think in order to get to 85%, we're going to have to have a more bridge model that is low barrier, it's accessible, people feel like they have privacy, they don't have to give up a bunch of their stuff or lifestyle to be able to go into into one of these programs. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, absolutely. There's, it's a part of that, just um, the design of the, the, 
the bridge the bridge housing sites themselves as well. It's also been it's been providers that are advising, but also we've been working with um, DMH and DHS that have a lot of extensive and, and I think especially in the case of one of the staff members firsthand experience as outreach workers who have spoken with people about what are the kinds of things that you know that keep people from wanting to go inside. And so they've given us a lot of feedback on these layouts to try and make sure that we're we're making them as as really accessible and always to people as possible. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, and um, a, a question, because you broke down, and I thank you for this, between uh, sort of uh, the, the different funding sources and the, and the number of beds and stuff. Some of the beds are funded by uh, county non-H resources, and, and you, you didn't really have some of the specifics on that, which I understand. Um, I, I want to make sure we're comparing apples and apples and not apples and, and, and oranges. We talk about the number of people who are homeless in Los Angeles and what it would take to provide a roof over their heads. When we talk about the county funded beds, those beds could be used by people who are, are homeless in Santa Monica or in uh, West Hollywood or Carson or somewhere else in the county, correct? Correct. When we did the projection of um, next year's beds and the one chart that identifies the goal of adding 2,000 something beds next year through Measure H, that is a county number since we haven't started to do distributions yet. It's unclear what exactly the city's portion will be. Historically, we found that it's somewhere around 70% of the beds end mm -hmm. up in the city, but that's kind of unknown until those are procured. Right. We, we do know of a couple of facilities for sure that are coming online within the city of LA that DMH or DHS or a combination of the two are planning to establish. And I think that probably the same is true for those facilities as for any other interim housing facility where people don't want to travel that far away from where they are now to enter an interim housing facility. And so while, yes, I think they'd be eligible countywide, my, I think that most providers would tell you that who's going to actually take advantage of those beds are people who are in the general area of where they're, of where they're placed. And uh, I haven't been able to get very deep into the report um, yet. How much in your calculations did you factor in that some of those beds will be used by more than one person because someone who's using the bed in... Turnover. Yeah, turnover, mm -hmm. thank you. That was a much faster way of saying it. <laughs> we didn't really calculate turnover um, into this initial model of uh, trying to shelter everyone. Really, the turnover is more the ramp down of beds needed um, is our ability we, 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 to... We are years away from needing to talk about yeah. ramp down. But R ramp, don't, don't even say ramp down. <laughs> ramp down doesn't matter. We, are, we, we aren't anywhere near where we need to ramp down. The, the turnover of beds is, is hard to calculate if we added that many beds because people are going to be sitting in beds for much longer if we added that many beds because we do not at the moment have the back end resources to assist people into permanent housing at that scale. So currently we are able to move people that are often entering to these bridge programs because they're being quickly linked to rapid rehousing, uh, permanent supportive housing, but we do not have 20,000 slots of permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing immediately available. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, Mr. Chair. Once, I, once you start uh, uh, editing what I'm saying to make it briefer, I know I should shut up. Um, uh, so I'm going to ask that we continue this so you can put the additional information in this report. But one of the things you just touched on would be useful to include in the comparison with New York and, and San Francisco and other cities. New York, for as I understand it, for a number of years had a very successful shelter model because it was linked with vouchers. And then uh, when, when Giuliani and one of his many manifestations of insanity and cruelty came in, he delinked it. 
uh, and since then it has become warehousing. And so I, I imagine it becomes a much more expensive intervention because it takes longer. So if you could address that in the report, uh, because I think that's helpful information to have. We can, we can look at New York's, it's a very expensive model overall. Um, and to your point, they find, find me a cheaper model too, so I can <laughs> they push do have. Uh, they may not be the best compares. I mean, they do have a shelter all model, but the way they're doing it is sticking families in motels, which are very expensive. Agree. Um, and to your point, they do have a lot of public housing that they link to, and that's how they're able to exit a good amount of people. New York has somewhere around. 500,000 units of public housing, by far the largest stock in the United States in comparison to Los Angeles that has somewhere slightly over 10,000 units, so a much different, uh, different landscape. But we'll look at some different areas, San Francisco, San Diego, um, Seattle. There's some other cities that would be good comparisons Thank to, you. to Los Angeles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Thank you. And just one, just really quick to point out, uh, we will definitely make sure that you get those numbers, but I would like to make sure to remind everyone that the shelter bed rate has actually been going up over the last couple of years yeah. here because the previous rate of $20 per bed per night, $30 is not enough to cover the, as you saw, the enhanced services that LASA is requiring of shelter providers. So I just want to manage expectations a little bit there. We may not be getting to something cheaper and the quality of, of services that you also outlined in the motion of, of being able to actually serve people at a level that is going to result in them, you know, not occupying that bed after 90 days and moving into something more permanent. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll note and file item number five. Uh, and then I know we have uh, questions and comments on item number six. Can we just uh, yes. continue it for a while so they can come back with the additional information Sh rather than note and file? Sure. Thanks. If we can change that to continue it uh, with those report backs in... 60 days. That'll be the order, and then we'll move to. Sure. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. You're saying yes. Yes. Not 60, 60 days, days is not enough time. time. Great. Um, so we'll continue uh, item number five and then move to item number six, uh, and we'll hear from Council Member Wizard. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And. Um, well, the good news is that we're discussing how much it costs to put up some shelters, and we've come a long way in terms of where we are addressing homelessness. This is, um, we have a lot of work to do, obviously, but there was a time when we were just trying to figure out what to do, and we kind of seem to, um, you know, we, we have some funding now in our budget and some money in our UB and the mayor's uh, bridge for housing. What's it called? It's called Bridge Home. Bridge home. Um, program, it seems like uh, at least we have some infrastructure that we built to get things done. Uh, when we were doing El Pueblo, um, we did kind of a back of the envelope calculation, how much that would cost. And so when we were put together a motion to ask to put emergency housing in, in Skid Row and how much it would cost to house uh, 2,000, we came up with about 20 million. And this, uh, the report you came back with, um, thank you by the way for the report, uh, it c comes out to about 30 million. So it's I think some of the same questions that I had about the cost uh, that Mr. Bonner was making to have the same questions in terms of the beds, you know, um, we, you had one person per bed, uh, can we, um, the, you know, people would use the bed, some people come couples, whatever it may be. So we could probably look at that and some other efficiencies to try to continue to find ways to be more efficient about this. Um, so the report itself, it's good news and bad. Uh, good news is that we have some one or two locations that we identified that we could possibly move forward. And we've identified about um, the need to have uh, in, in, uh, about, um, there are about 2,145 unsheltered in Skid Row. So in terms of the, of the uh, Paloma site, uh, that is something that the county has proposed. Now, have we been in talks with them and this is a pr private property, so how is that going? Yes, so the county has, um, and it's the Department of Health, Serv Health Services, mm -hmm. yes, is in, is in contact with the owner who is actually, is the last I heard, is actually going to make whatever improvements are needed to bring the facility up to code for residential occupancy. It was not formerly a residential facility. 
uh, and then they would lease the facility to the Department of Health Services to establish, I think it's somewhere between 100 and 150 new beds um, on that site. The, um, it's really been a, co a cooperation in trying to help with um, getting DHHS in touch with the right staff at um, the Department of Building and Safety, the, Depart the Fire Department, to make sure that they understand what the requirements are to bring the building to code so that those renovations can be made and the facility can, can open up. But at this point, um, it's my understanding that they're moving, they're moving forward with that and we're providing as much assistance as we can on um, getting them the right advice quickly and then expediting the permitting process when they're ready to submit plans. And can we, uh, so we, we will use the crisis shelter ordinance, is that correct, for that site? Or is I that think at this one, because they want to operate it permanently, so beyond the, the crisis shelter ordinance gives them some flexibility on the zoning, which they don't need. Mm. And um, because the, the kind of modified health and safety standards that were approved are really only allowable because of the state law, and the state law at this point sunsets in 2021, um, they want to do the renovations to our regular code so that they don't have to do it again if the state law isn't extended. Yeah. Now, our motion asked to uh, attempt to identify publicly owned properties. Now, did you also look at potential uh, opportunities to lease sites? We, we did not do this okay. process. And uh, so that, that also provides us, looking at this model, provides us additional opportunities to look at lease sites. and. I, before we put the motion out there, I, I had a sense that it would be very difficult to find publicly owned properties, but as we, after putting the motion, we had a lot of discussion with um, some brokerage firms, interestingly, who have mapped out all of downtown Los Angeles, have a good sense of which buildings may uh, be potential uh, shelter sites um, for us. And so in the direction I'll give today, we're, I'll, I'll provide some direction that we look at uh, opportunities to lease some sites and uh, if we could work in the interim with my staff and to connect you with some of the brokerage firms that we have been talking about that have um, some good mapping uh, done already that yeah. may, may, make, may make that work a lot easier for us. So I think that's a good example of the direction um, we can go if we move forward with that um, Paloma site. The other site was the uh, the former Children's Museum above the L.A. City Mall. Can, yes. can you talk a little bit more about that site? Sure. Um, that site is city-owned, and it was until very recently occupied by the city attorney's office, by staff from the city attorney's office, who have since moved to um, renovated space in City Hall. And before that, there was also a portion of the site that was occupied occupied by LAPD that has also um, moved into another space. So at this time, the, the whole facility, uh, that whole floor is now uh, completely vacant. It has, um, it has the, it could be easily converted into uh, an interim housing site. It has water and existing bathrooms, space to establish shower facilities it could be uh, renovated into, into an interim housing site that we haven't done the, the analysis, but um, yeah. it, it could, it looks like it could actually accommodate quite a large number of beds. Right. No, thank you. Beds. So my, my takeaways from this is one, to see if we could do this more efficiently um, in terms of the questions that Mr. Bonin asked. Second, I think if we could look at additional opportunities to do some leasing in the area, and third, although the Children's Museum is not in Skid Row per se, it does address the needs of, um, of the downtown area and the, and the need to immediately shelter individuals. Uh, I also, the discussion held earlier about, we, as we put these shelters up, we, I would hope that we try to find ways to get the people who, who are locally near the shelters, um, um, in the shelters, you know, the. Uh, one of the biggest concerns from um, El Pueblo merchants when they were not happy that we were putting that site up there is that they saw it as a magnet that we would bring more homeless to the area rather than address the needs in the area. So I've prepared a written instructions that I've given to the clerk and I don't know if those need to be read, Mr. Chair, or, um, or should I read them? Just, um, just yeah. really quick before, um, we also, and I should have mentioned this, in addition to our asset management group, met with your office about, you know, all 
city-owned sites in all of CD14, and we mm. didn't find a lot aside from the Children's Museum that's close to Skid Row. And so as a result, we have actually already asked GSD's real estate division to look at sites that are for lease in, in your district as well, given that there weren't a lot of sites along their first pass. So okay. that, that, is, that leasing analysis should be, we hope to have that for you soon. Very soon, okay. Thank Sorry you. about that. Mr. Chairman, just, just, a, just a comment. I know we we're trying to leverage limited resources, and I just want to thank uh, um, the Councilman for his, uh, his efforts here in Skid Row specifically uh, and, and trying to make sure that resources are available. The Paloma site that, you, that, we, that you're looking at, uh, uh, Councilman also has the added benefit of, of potentially serving CD9. Yeah. And, yeah. And so we appreciate that. Uh, yeah. We know that there's a desire for facilities to support uh, uh, those populations in the particular area. And so again, while uh, it's, you know, it's not in nine, it certainly would, would benefit uh, individuals who are trying to assist who happen to live in that area. I appreciate the opportunity to work with you on that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Price. So we're going to read those instructions into the record. Instruct the City Administrative Officer, CAO, to begin evaluation on the former Children's Museum as crisis shelter. Instruct the CAO to begin evaluation of 1426 Paloma as crisis shelter in collabora co collaboration with the county. Instruct the CAO to evaluate parking lots at city facilities in the downtown area to determine their feasibility as safe parking locations. Instruct the CAO to review possible lease agreements with privately owned sites for crisis shelter and safe parking. Instruct LAHSA and CAO to report back to council on expiration of lease for the bin and options for extending the lease or replacing it through lease or purchase. Instruct LAHSA and CAO to report back on expiration of lease for Skid Row refresh spot and options for extending the lease or relocating the site, and instruct the CAO to identify any state properties that could be used in response to the homelessness crisis and to coordinate with state agencies to determine the feasibility of their use and to report back to council with next steps, including the status of any identification of properties per council file 18-002-S1, Wezar harris dawson motion. Got Thank it. you. And, and if I could add, um, on this report, you know, Children's, uh, Children's uh, Museum, we are moving forward with adopting a master, a Civic Center master plan, and just yesterday in committee approved the financing plan for, and the demolition of the old Parker Center site. Uh, we are implementing the master plan in phases. Uh, the Parker Center site is first phase. Eventually it extends into the Children's Museum, but that's not for another five, ten years. But at least, as that city building sits vacant and we have no, we haven't purposed it for anything. We could use it for crisis um, uh, shelters. And secondly, uh, Mr. Price, uh, his comments did raise an issue for me, and that is that, for as we think of the downtown area and Skid Row in particular, it uh, if we're looking at places to lease properties if we review could extend south of the 10 freeway, and although it's not CD14, it's CD9, mm -hmm. um, there's some synergies there in terms of possible available properties. And secondly, the uh, Skid Row population um, does traverse the 10 freeway often. We see a lot of the homeless people yeah, going back and forth between that area of downtown and Skid Row. So it'd be great to extend your review south of the 10 um, as far as you see feasible. Thank you so much. Well, we, so the um, motion will be that we adopt this as amended. I think I need a second. 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 It's been seconded. Hearing no objection, that'll be the order. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Is there any other business for the good of the order? The agenda's clear. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. The order is good. Thank you, sir.